in the 1955, when I was 32 years old, I signed a contract to write a physics, engineering physics textbook to John Wiley and Sons without a single word having been written. Uh, the editor's letter said, uh, your ideas and the glint in your eyes is enough for us. Uh, John Wiley and Sons had no engineering physics text and they were dying to get one. And I was then at the University of Pittsburgh uh, lecturing in the engineering physics course, amongst other things. And I got religious fervor about what was wrong with the teaching of physics. And finally, people told me I should put my money where my mouth is and write a book. So I went to see the chairman of the department, who was Dave Halliday, and who had, prior to that, written a pioneering nuclear physics text that a few of you might remember. But it was pioneering, seriously. Uh, <laughs> in any case, uh, Dave said, uh, I want to write an atomic physics book. Why don't we get together? We can write the introductory book, and then we'll write an atomic one. I said, fine. And of course, we never did write the atomic physics book. Uh, well, one year later, in 1956, uh, I was seduced away to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Uh, I was invited to give a talk there. I think it was upper atmosphere of physics. And for some reason, uh, they kept after me and uh, made an offer. And every time I demurred, the offer got better and better. And I didn't know what was going on. I wish I had at the time. It turns out that the chairman of the board of John Wiley and Sons was on the trustees at RPI, and he wanted to get me there. And every time I raised an objection to the chairman about I didn't have this or I didn't have that, I, the next week I got it. And uh, so I got an offer that I simply couldn't refuse. And it turns out that that is what led to the success of the book. Because at, uh, at RPI, there was a four semester introductory course in engineering physics that every member of the physics faculty and graduate student took part in teaching. Uh, and the quality of the students there was several levels above that uh, at Pitt, which at the time was a playboy school or playgirl school, whatever. Um, I was able to raise funds to completely revise that course based on the ideas that I had uh, with marvelous people to build lecture demonstrations, lab experiments, audio visual aids. And in the process then of going through this course, Dave and I produced one chapter after a time, just somehow having an outline, staying ahead of the students, reproducing the notes. And so we went through about four years of classroom testing uh, with that kind of audience and with the spirit that uh, many of you in education might know, the Hawthorne effect, everybody knew he was taking part in some experiment and uh, they were all charged up about it. And as you can imagine, I got more opinions than I could handle, uh, most of them self-contradictory, of course, uh, that you had to know how to cope with. Well, the book was ready for production uh, when I learned that uh, John Wiley and Sons was hesitating about publishing it. It seems that they had sent the book out to reviewers, five to seven faculty members, chiefly to, in the hopes that they would adopt it at their institution once it was published. And every single review was negative. Uh, no professor said he would use the book, and they all had a whole series of complaints. And so unbeknownst to me, I learned of this from Bob Sproul, who was a uh, solid state physics author at the time for Wiley and who was on the board of John Wiley and Sons, that they seriously thought of postponing publication of the book so we would change it. But Sproul convinced them to, let, to publish the book the way Dave and I wanted it done. So the book got published, and of course, it was an instant success. So you can imagine my attitude towards reviewers. Uh, I thought it'd be worthwhile telling you some of the complaints that the reviewers had so that in retrospect, you could see why the book succeeded. The critics complained that some or many of their favorite topics had been left out. And indeed, if you look at the preface to the book, we list about 50 topics in physics that were not in our book, but were in, let's say, Sears and Zemanski. And the idea was that we wanted to go more deeply into fewer topics. Today, that's called less, maybe more. The second complaint was 
that the discussion left nothing for them to say. <laughs> I heard this from quite, quite a few people. But the book was deliberately its own study guide because mass education was coming on at the time in the colleges and lecture halls were getting filled bigger and bigger and students had less chance to learn from a professor and the book became much more important. So they studied and learned from the book and it, with worked examples and Lord knows what else, it did become sort of its own study guide. Um, a third thing that they complained about was that the level was too high the mathematical level. We had introduced vector algebra. Can you imagine? Dot and cross products. That was revolutionary then. And we presented Maxwell's equations uh, in integral form, which are easy to understand actually, but it seemed kind of advanced. But of course, after Sputnik, standards were rising dramatically then. You may remember the good days of physics when you didn't care whether the students sank or swam, you know, or swam. You know, we had so many students coming in, you just took the best off the top. Today, we wish we didn't behave so arrogantly, I guess. But in any case, uh, you might say the timing was excellent. Now, Dave and I uh, had no idea that the book would be a success like that. I was writing for RPI students and hoped that Carnegie Tech would use it and MIT and Caltech and so forth, not Mississippi or places like that. Um, there were also complaints that we violated the traditional order of things, that we sort of uh, heralded the coming of relativity and quantum physics as you went through the book when chance occurred for us to mention that, and that we had sprinkled modern physics throughout the book, which indeed we had done, and that all that stuff should be at the back at the end and not in the book itself. Well, of course, Dave and I were representing the new young post-World War II research physicists, he an experimentalist and I a theorist, who somehow in our bones knew that this is what we wanted to do and this is what physics should be like, not knowing how in tune we were going to be with the trends at the time. So in that sense, we were lucky. But in another sense, I guess we've come to realize later uh, that this book really represented a paradigm shift in the teaching of physics, for better or worse. Uh, and somehow it's still around. <laughs>